Hi hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining us for this call. Uh, this is a, a, a very uh, a call that I love to make, a, a lecture that I love to give, because it's really at the end of the day what this is all about. You know, Ayurveda is the science of life. Ayur means life and Veda means truth, so it's the science of letting the truth of your life out. Right? So that's really the goal of Ayurveda, which is to let the truth of your life out. Well, what is that? And I think that's what this call video is all about, is trying to understand how we can do that, how Ayurveda intended for that to happen. Every Vedic science, whether it be yoga or Ayurveda, they're all designed really for transformational change, to free ourselves from this crazy mind of ours that locks us into patterns of behavior that provided a, a level of safety and a level of security that we that was required as a child but clearly not needed any longer as an adult. So so that's where I wanna I want to start. I want to start with this idea that how do we free ourselves and, and, and what are we freeing ourselves from. And maybe the best way to start this lecture is to talk about children, how we are hardwired as children to get the approval from our parents. We really want them to love us. We really want them to care for us and need us. Now, if we didn't care that our parents loved us, then we would wander into the jungle, get eaten by a lion, and there'd be no people. So clearly, we really needed and hardwired to have mom and dad approve of us and take care of us. And, and therefore, we have projected that need on the screen for an entire life. Now, in the animal world, if you're a lion and at some point, mama lion says, I'm going north, you're going south, and we'll see you in the next life. And the lion cub has to figure out how to do this all by himself. As humans, we just replace mom and dad with dark chocolate, or a latte, or a new pair of shoes, or Starbucks, or, or a new house, or a job, or making a lot of money, or being very successful, or having lots of children. All these things we do as a, as a way to get satisfied, to get ourselves satisfied by something, that, um, by, that, by something outside of ourselves. And the game of life, that I like to call it, is played when you realize that I'm still projecting on the screen patterns of behavior that are intended to get a return on investment, that are intended to get people to like me, approve of me, for me to feel ultimately safe and secure. So that is the MO, our human MO, is to grow up wanting everyone to approve of us, and in the name of doing that, we become straight-A students and class clowns and perfectionists and pleasers and caregivers and, and a whole host of things that we create to get the approval of others, right? And usually we do a pretty good job. Invariably though, it doesn't always work out. Somehow along the way, I didn't get the feedback. I didn't get the return on my investment. They didn't love me. They didn't approve of me. I never got the love that I really felt I needed I never got the presence and the care that I really felt I needed. I always felt like someone else, my mom and dad, loved more. Something along those lines. And, uh, and as a result, we feel uh, unsafe. And as a result of feeling unsafe, we get hurt feelings. See, the mind is sort of like a balancing act. You know, everything has to equal, okay? If I love you, then then you know so much that you have that I have to uh, you have to love me back equally and then we're on balance and I feel safe and secure right so if I buy you a birthday present for twenty dollars and you go to the dollar store and get me one a present from the dollar store my mind I quickly feel hurt feelings and my mind calculates that I want nineteen dollars back and I want that nineteen dollars perhaps in cash right that would be great but I never have got cash and therefore, I have to figure out another way to be safe, to be secure, to get satisfied. So I create an emotional reaction to that. Maybe I become a little bit passive-aggressive. Maybe I became a little or become a little bit mean 
or maybe I go drink a bottle of wine or go shopping or, you know, go find some other stimulus to do, give me some sense of satisfaction. At least my $19 worth is what I'm looking for. So as a result of being hurt, we create a new emotion. And we store those emotions in our fat cells. And those emotions in our fat, along with fat-soluble toxins and chemicals, environmental pollutants, all the sort of yucky stuff goes into the fat. And that fat remotely makes us think and do the same dumb stuff again and again and again. So we are pre-recorded. We have these stress pre-recorded responses to handle stressors that we've experienced in the past. They're ready to go. Boom. From one stress, we just feel those impulses to react. That's why I talk a lot about going home for the holidays and we start acting like four-year-olds again and we wonder why am I acting like a four-year-old every time I get around my family because it's triggering old pre-recorded stress responses. Now we know that there is science behind this at the NIH, National Institutes of Health, we know that there are molecules of emotion. There are little emotional molecules carried by little peptides, little proteins, and they they're carried all over our body. And they lodge in certain places. They lodge in your brain, they lodge in your heart or in your respiratory tract, and they lodge in your intestinal tract, your skin, and your spine. Now, in Ayurveda, we have done a lots of, uh, there's been lots of therapies geared to those areas. When you're doing oil massage on your skin, you know, obviously uh, taking care and treating the skin uh, in fact, we now know that the oil on your skin, the sebum on, that's manufactured by your skin, actually feeds the microbes, and the microbes support the immunity. And, and, and the microbes on your skin, in your gut, everywhere, are extremely sensitive to stress. Uh, the microbes, if you were to have an emotional reaction or, or have been under some stress, the microbes on your body, the good guys would go south and the bad guys would go north. They know that they take the fecal matter out of an anxious mouse and put it into a calm mouse, the calm mouse gets anxious. They actually know if they took a container of yogurt like this and had yogurt, the bugs in that yogurt, if I had an emotional reaction right now, the bugs in this container of yogurt outside my body would dramatically change. We know that when, when people are subjected to loss of stress, good bugs go south and the bad bugs go north. We know that what we think, what we feel, and what we see impact our microbiology on our skin, on the outside of our body, but also on the inside of our body where the intestinal wall is. So doing oil massage on your skin helps to feed the microbes, supports the immunity, the health, the luster, the radiance of your skin, but also it supports the microbiology that creates and manufactures the neurotransmitters, most of which is taking place inside your intestinal tract. Okay, 95% of your serotonin and more than 50% of dopamine, other neurotransmitters, are produced inside your gut. Only 5% of your serotonin for mood support is in your brain at any given time. So I don't even understand that. How does that make sense? How in the world does it, how in the world do we have um, all the, um, how do we have all the neurotransmitters for mood support inside of our gut, only 5% in our brain? So these molecules of emotional receptors are also in our intestinal tract. And we now know things like uh, taking ghee as part of our Cleanses that we do Ayurvedic, we have a Colorado cleanse and the short home cleanse and the lighten up cleanse. Even Ayurvedically eating or putting ghee. Ghee is clarified butter. Butter is named after butyric acid. And now we know that your intestinal wall makes its own butyric acid. It makes its own ghee, basically. And in fact, that, that butter, that butter fat that ghee is made out of, feeds the microbes in your gut that support the ability for them to manufacture the neurotransmitters to deliver mood stability. To create ultimately a platform so you can access the truth of you, which is to be loving. You also know that 
there's a concentration of these receptors in your respiratory tract for deep breathing exercises. It's in your brain for shiradhara, pouring oil over your forehead, meditation, Ayurvedic massage. There's so many Ayurvedic techniques, yoga techniques for your mind to calm and still your mind. Uh, yoga for your spine. There's also lots of these receptors in your spine. So we know that there are these molecules of emotional receptors all over these places. We also know that these receptors are used by your immune system and your endocrine system, your whole hormone system, and also used by your nervous system as well as your psychology. So it is an information network, they called it, at the NIH, as opposed to just receptors for the emotions. And their takeaway was that if you have a blocked emotion, that it will block the flow of this information network affecting the function of your immune system, your endocrine system, your hormone system, your psychology, your entire nervous system, as well as your mood, and literally cause disease. And that was their takeaway, that if you have a blocked emotion, it will actually block the flow of this information network and cause disease. Now in Ayurveda, thousands of years ago, they said, if you have a blocked emotion, it's called mental ama, it would block the flow of the subtle energy in the body and literally cause disease. So we really do have some good science to support this concept that our body is very, very much involved in supporting an emotional platform. So we create these emotions as a result of getting a gift from the dollar store and feeling I want my $19 back. And as a result of that, we project an emotion on the screen, and as a result of that, we feel um, an emotional reaction, the need to create an emotional reaction. And as a result uh, of that hurt feelings, we now have a new emotion projected on the screen. So one of the ways that we deal with that in Ayurveda is to help the body be a better fat burner. With an Ayurveda, it was said that these emotions are stored in the fat. So if we become a good fat burner, we get to burn fat and detoxify and release these molecules of emotion. So they're freed up, and these molecules of emotion are free. So eating three meals a day, uh, having more good fats in your diet, having more fiber in your diet, all the things that we've been talking about lately, helping the body be a good fat burner, getting proper exercise, not overeating, eating balanced meals, all these things relate to the ability to be a good stable fat burner. And when you're a fat burner, you have access to some of these old mental and emotional patterns. Okay? And what happens as a result of being more physically balanced is you become more clear, more less physically dense, and more mentally aware, more mentally aware of old protective patterns of behavior that you may have created as a child that you're still projecting on the screen as an adult. So as a result, we have created this movie, or the movie that we are projecting on the screen, we are playing oftentimes a role that we had to play as a young child. We took our raw material, our gifts, our talents, and we became a version of ourselves that we projected on the screen to make everybody like us. And for the most part, it sort of worked, right? People sort of liked us, and we got through childhood. But at the more that we play that role on, on the movie screen, which is based on needing them to like us, the more that we have to keep ratcheting up our performance. Every day, the performance has to become greater. We have to do bigger, greater, bigger things. We become a more of a perfectionist. We have to become the super mom. We have to become the one who volunteers for every single thing. We have to be the best worker, the best wife, the best caregiver, the, 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 the person who really is it's impossible to accomplish. All what we're asking you know, many moms and, and dads as well to do. It's just not possible. But we put a lot of pressure on ourselves because we're conditioned to get the return on that investment. Now, when we fall in love with someone, we love them very much, and 
we, we also love them with this notion that we want them to love us back. Uh, I, I got a question here earlier on, and I, and, I, and I invite you to, if you have questions, to push star two uh, along the way to raise your hand, and I'll, I'll get to you. I can see you on the screen here, and I'll get to you so we can have a little interaction here and, and type in your questions as well, so please feel free to do that. And um, so one of the questions that I got that I think would fit here is that, is it selfish to do something nice for someone if you do it to make yourself feel good? This is an interesting question, right? If I do something nice for someone, but I do it because it makes me feel good, is that selfish? Is that the wrong way to do it? Well, there's an old saying that says, I love you, but this open is one of yours. Which means that I, my nature is love, and my nature is to be love, and my nature is to express love. But my mind, a long time ago, when I was a young kid, realized that this world wasn't that safe. They made fun of my lunchbox and my backpack. And they messed with me and bullied me. So I had to protect myself. And I walled off that delicate expression of that love. So I walled that off. And I created a personality that I thought would be safer. I became the funny guy, the class clown. I became you know, the perfectionist, the pleaser. And, and we all have done something like that. Of course, the question is, is that personality serving you? The role that you're playing in that movie, is that role serving you? Are you feeling deeply content? Or do you keep having to ratchet up your performance to get them to like you because it doesn't feel like you're getting enough feedback from your performances night to night? When do we get to play the role we were meant to play in this life? Okay. So if I do something for someone and I feel good, Am I being selfish? No, not at all. The reason why you do something for someone else is actually so you feel good. And that, I know it sounds terrible, right? And the reason we do things is for other people. We serve them, we give to them, we care. I get it. There's a hormone called oxytocin, which is the giving, loving, bonding hormone. It's the one that we produce that when we when the, when the mother gives birth, it's the one that bonds the mom and the dad and the baby together for life. It's the one that you, that's produced when you hug and love and care for someone in need. It's all that. So important of a hormone. So different than the hormone called dopamine, which is the I got to have it right now hormone. And that hormone is depleting. It's diminishing. The more you produce it, the more you stimulate yourself with money and power and fame and coffee the more stimulants you need to get that same reaction. And as a result, we never feel satisfied by stimulating ourselves. Oxytocin is the loving, giving, bonding hormone. And, it, you get, and that fills you up from the act of giving. So it's sort of, I love the analogy of the sun. The sun gives love, the warmth, and light. But does it care if the flower blossoms? Does it care you know, if the trees turn color? Does it stop shining light when we chop its trees down in Brazil or kill its cattle? Does it stop? No, it can't. I don't think the sun can stop loving and giving. I mean, gosh, what do you think the sun thinks about the moon? I mean, here we have billions of years of giving its light and its love and its warmth and nothing, like not, not even a sprout. The moon has done absolutely nothing but all this love and attention. The sun doesn't care. And I believe that our nature is the same way. It doesn't care about the outcome. It's our mind that cares about the outcome. So the heart just wants to give, and its nature is to love, just like the sun. Now, if the sun said, okay, no more sun for Brazil, because they're chopping my trees down, no more sun for Texas, because they're killing cattle, that's it. The sun would implode. And as a result of that implosion, I think bad things would happen. If we stop giving love, which we do as a result of navigating our childhood, sometimes didn't go so well, all that stress impacts our intestinal tract. We process that all through our intestinal tract. It takes out our microbes. It takes our ability to make special and certain neurotransmitters to make our mood stable. 
and now we don't have the neurotransmitters that we need to create a stable platform to love fully. So we have to create an emotion. Something go outside of ourselves to get satisfied and cared for by another person. And that's the nature of us. And the game of life is to become more self-aware, which is what Ayurveda is about. So you can become aware of what your crazy mind is doing, what patterns of behavior it's conjured up in the name of safety and security, and then what action steps you can take to free yourself from these old patterns. There's another old saying that says, to the extent that something affects you is to the extent that it is your karma. To the extent that someone affects you is to the extent that it is your opportunity to act. Karma means action. So it's the opportunity to take a transformational action step. So, so going back to my question, if I do something that um, if it's, is it selfish for me to do something for someone else that makes me feel good? Well, first of all, it's the nature of giving and caring for another that produces oxytocin that is going to inherently make you feel good. And that's the reason that we do it. We, uh, we have partners and that we love very dearly. And we love them. And we think that we love them so they love us back. But the reality is, is we love loving them. And what I want to challenge you all to do is to become aware of the truth of the relationship. The truth of the relationship is that you love this person. And there are probably lots of reasons why you don't love them all the time. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm sure that if you have a husband who likes to watch the football game or the basketball game, uh, and many times the moms don't really appreciate that, they feel like they've been working all day really hard, and they have. And then when dad comes home, he sits down and he wants to watch the game. And, uh, and the mom sort of says, lets, her, lets them know with no uncertain terms that, uh, you know, I'm not really happy with you sitting on the couch doing nothing. You should be interacting with me, and we should be having fun together right now. And the husband definitely feels like, uh, knows that she's probably not that happy with him at that moment in time. But, you know, he then as a result of that sort of retreats into his protective shell and feels like, you know, she's not mad at me, she's mad at me, she's sort of throwing a dart at me, I retreat from that dart and I feel a little bit unsafe right now. And I feel a little bit hurt, okay? And she's feeling hurt. So now I'm feeling a little little withdrawn and so I'm not feeling my happy-go-lucky self to love her so she's not going to feel loved by me. And as a result of her not feeling loved by me, she feels like she wants to retreat and feels unsafe because she's not feeling loved by me. So she retreats, and I feel her retreat, or he feels her retreat. And as a result of that, um, we have this separation where both parties are going, and we end up with a life that is sort of parallel, coexisting, not acting on the truth of the relationship anymore. You're acting on the behavior of someone else. When he's sitting there on the couch watching the game, and I get mad, but I don't say anything, but I sort of passively send some messages to him that I'm not happy with him, then I am acting on his behavior. I'm not acting on mine. So the goal of Ayurvedic psychology is to realize when you are acting on their behavior. That's called subjective or objective referral. You're referring on the object as opposed to referring on you, the subject. So when you engage in behavior based on another person's activity, you're sort of, um, you know, you're in trouble. You're in a situation now where you're not acting on your own true self. So the goal is for us to begin to act on our true nature and to let the truth of us out, and to become more aware of when we are actually acting on their behavior. So ask yourself, do I love my husband? Yes. Do I um, hold back my love sometimes for him? Probably yes. 
ask yourself, why do I do that? The reason I do that, well, if I loved him all the time, you'd think it'd be okay to watch the game and sort of do nothing. So I have to send a message to him to sort of be mean. So my mind has convinced me that I have to be this kind of mean version of myself, this controlling version of myself. Otherwise, he'll sit there and watch the game every night and do nothing. So as a result, I have to, I have to, um, I have to become a. Um, hang on a second. Hang on a second. Okay, so, so, um, so as a result, you know, I have this situation where I have some questions I'm going to go through in a second, but I have this situation where I, you know, I love them, but I don't act on it. And why am I not acting on that experience of, of love? Well, I, my mind is convinced that I have to become this mean version of myself, so I therefore become this mean version of myself for years and years and years. And as a result of that, when do I get to be my happy-go-lucky self? My mind is convinced me I will be happy once they change, once they get their act together, get their life together, then I will change and become my happy-go-lucky self. But until they change, I have to send this message. We do it with our kids. Our kids feel like if I don't get straight A's or perform and do these things, I'm not feeling worthy of mom and dad's love. And we sort of, as crazy as it sounds, we sort of set up these patterns of behavior in our own children. And it's not because we are doing something intentional, it's unintentional. But we, we set up little hoops for them to jump through, then we feed them with love when they're worthy of that love, as opposed to for the son. It just gives love because it's his nature to do that. It can't not. And the flower feels safe in that sunlight to open its petals and be itself. So when you choose to give yourself permission to love your husband, wife, spouse fully, but they will feel safe in that sunlight to open the delicate petals of their flower and let the truth of them out, as opposed to um, feeling that I have to become this mean version myself because their behavior is inappropriate or, or unhealthy or whatever, I think it is anyway. So as a result, I have to become a, another person. I become a different person, another version of myself. And that's the goal, is to not give anyone the power for you to be a different version of yourself. This is, this is the, the game of life, is to not give anyone that power to make you into something that you're not. That's the goal. And if you love that person, then I suggest during this holiday, Valentine, is to love them fully. You know, don't love them because... I, you know, they're being really nice in the last week or month or two, and they deserve love. Don't love them because they have been, or not love them because they've been sort of a jerk lately. I'm going to give them the small box of chocolate versus the large box of chocolate. Do you love that person? Use that as an opportunity to give yourself fully to that experience and love them fully, not for them because it's laying down new pavement in your brain that allows you to lay neural pathways that say, I can give myself fully to this situation. See, my mind, if I keep saying I can't be fully loving to that person because they watch the game or they're sort of a jerk or whatever it is, but I have these patterns of behavior in my brain. They're like pavement roads going down that direction. I want to lay down new pavement. I want to lay down new roads, new roads that say I can love fully. So you got to pick the low-hanging fruit, which is, I love my wife, so, but, you know, I don't love her fully because she makes me crazy sometimes. So we have to tap into the truth, which is that I love her, and then give yourself permission to do that. That happens with what's called random acts of kindness. First step is randomly act on the truth of you, which is to be loving and joyful and kind for no reason. It's your nature to do that. That's the goal. So by randomly acting on something, sending a little message, a little text, honey, honey, hope you're doing, having a nice day today, um, leave her a little note, leave her a little gift, send her a little text. These are laying down pavement in your brain that says it's okay to be the sun and shine fully, even though they're chopping your trees down. Hopefully that makes sense. 
And once you begin to lay down that pavement, and you become facilitated to actually love and give love and act on it, okay, transformational change, new neurological pathways in your brain and say, it's okay for me to take the risk to be fully loving again, play the role of love and, 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 and compassion and joy and being powerful that I wasn't allowed to be as a child. And to take that risk is what this is really all about. And you have family members who you love, but you don't act on it. And that's the key, is to act on those relationships. Pick the fruit that's easy to act on. Let me uh, ask some questions here. Another question here, which was, um, let me answer this question first, which is, um, um, you know, is it selfish for me to do something nice for someone, even if it makes, even if it's, uh, even if it um, makes yourself feel good? Of course, the answer to that is absolutely yes. And giving someone something should make you feel good. How can we fully love someone who's manipulative without being taken advantage of? This is a very important question. Is there a way to love someone without being negative or, you know, um, or becoming kind of a negative person, you know, or how do you love someone who is sort of a negative person? How do you handle that? In your family, there's people that you love fully, people that you can easily give your heart and soul to very easily. But out in the world, there's people who are sort of crazy, right? They're throwing darts at you and they're sort of mean to you. And um, so sometimes we have to use what are called aspects of love. And the first aspect of love is called compassion. And compassion means that if you were on the battlefield and you saw someone bleeding to death, um, you would care for them. And before you could help them, you'd want to take your armor and your weapons and put them down, and then you could serve them. So before you can truly be compassionate, you must take your armor, protective armor off. And remember, if someone's being mean to you, someone's throwing a dart at you, you've got to ask yourself three things. Number one. You can, you can respond in three different ways. One, I can throw a dart back. Two, I can run away from them because I don't like being, having darts thrown at me. And three, I can realize that the only reason they would have ever thrown a dart was because they were probably hurt in the first place. If I throw a dart at an already hurt person, I can sh pretty much expect more darts thrown my way. If I run away from a person who's throwing darts at me, I can expect, again, more darts coming my way because the re when they see me run away, they go, see, they never really loved me in the first place. You see, a rose, I'm sure at some point in its evolution, didn't have thorns. And after being trampled for many, many hundreds of thousands of years, it threw some thorns to protect itself. I don't think the rose bush ever thought anybody would notice the thorns. So when the person who's been hurt has now become a little thorny and is throwing darts at you and being mean to you, and you react to that meanness, you're reacting based on their behavior. Your nature is to be loving, kind, joyful for no reason. That's who you are. But you're not acting on you, you're acting on them. So when you throw a dart back at them, you're just throwing darts back at someone who's already hurt. So expect more darts. The person who got thorny, they didn't think that you would notice their darts. They're still hardwired to want mom and dad to love them. They're hardwired for that. That's what they want. And they had to grow some thorns because they stopped getting, they started getting trampled constantly, and they felt like, golly, you know, I gotta have some thorns here to protect, but but my real desire is for them to love me. And they didn't think anybody would notice the thorns or the dart throwing. And that's what happens. So the third response is to realize that they're hurt and respond with compassion and understanding that they were at one point in their life a eight-year-old little kid trying to get love and approval from mom and dad never happened. And as a result, I've created a personality, a pleaser, control freak, class and class clown, a perfectionist, straight A student. Or I grew some thorns, got a little mean and tough around the edges. And that's what I, that's what I now project on the screen. And as, through the window of compassion, I can see why they do that. 
through the window of compassion, I have understanding as to why they are the way they are today. And through that window of compassion, I have the next aspect of love, which is gratitude. Gratitude for seeing the truth of that person, understanding why they're throwing thorns in the first place. And I'm not going to have to react on that because I realize that they're really hurt, that they're in pain. And why am I going to throw darts at someone who's hurting? My nature isn't to throw darts. Why should I throw darts based on their behavior? So I get to do me, which is to love them and have understanding and compassion for them. Compassion is, gives you the understanding. And the understanding gives you gratitude. Gratitude comes from the word freedom, or gratis, which gives you the freedom to act on your truth, the joy, the love. That's your true nature. So when you have someone who's hard, who's manipulative, or really mean, I can't even... I can't even tell you how many times that I've seen this happen. In, I was just told a story this morning about a woman who had a boss who was really mean and, and, and would constantly tell this person what was wrong with them and why they never did right in their job and they didn't sign this paper and they were you know, always kind of complaining about their work and, and to the point where they just really didn't like each other, didn't talk to each other. And um, so finally this woman decided to just say you know, to the woman, to close the door and say, you know what? I just want to tell you that I'm really sorry for all the things that have that gone on. I know I haven't done my paperwork right, and I really apologize. I'm really doing my best. I know you've got a lot on your plate, and I really understand where you're coming from, and I really, I'm really so sorry that we got off from this wrong. But the woman started crying. She, had, she told her, her, her story and all the things that were going on in her life that nobody really knew, and now they're like best friends. A simple act of kindness. When you begin to love your spouse, your husband, your wife, in a way that's based on your truth, they will feel safe in that sunlight to open the petals of their flower and let the truth of them out. And when that happens, you are giving the truth of yourself. And that relationship is called true love. Not giving with an expectation that they will give. Not giving because they deserve it or don't deserve it. Giving because it's your nature to love. That's what I'm asking you to do this season, is to give because it's your nature to love and no other reason, no expectation that they become happy, no expectation that they return anything in favor, is because that is who you are. And when you begin to act on that, that is your most powerful place. That is where you become the most powerful, loving, kind, giving version of yourself. And that is a level of contentment. You can't, you can't replace that. That's not that. That's that is what oxytocin, that hormone, is all about. It's about love and giving and kindness. So I got a couple of questions here. Um, one is, uh, is there an NI study that you would recommend that we learn more about, about how our bodies store our molecules of motion? You can read all about the molecules of motion in a book by Candice Pert, unfortunately the late Candice Pert, and she wrote a book called The Molecules of Motion. Fantastic book, cites all of her research, so that would be a great book that I would suggest to read. Um, uh, another question here from North Attleboro. Do, you, do your emotions get blocked and blocked and network when you have a spinal trauma and nerve damage? Um, I don't, I can't actually answer that question because I don't know enough about the research or even if they did that kind of research. What their takeaway was that the biggest block for these molecules of emotion, these receptors were Emotion, unreleased emotions, old patterns, old hurts, old traumas that we hold on to for dear life, those have to go. You know, when you think about why I'm not able to love my husband, you know, why am I, not, you know, the mom who's the super mom who wants, who does everything and never says no, it has to be because I want some approval. I'm still searching for that approval that I never, ever got. And I'll prove to the world that I, that I deserve that approval in some way. And I waste myself, I exhaust myself, I deplete myself in that process. That's what we know. Uh, another question. Um, 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 would you address depression for someone in midlife, in a long-term relationship, but without children, dwelling on the lack rather than joy and abundance? So how do we deal with depression in midlife, in a long-term relationship, but without children. I would suggest that this is a perfect example. My guess is in this situation that the person who's in a long-term relation that's depressed loves the other person. That there's a platform underneath the depression that is safe 
that they love that person, but they don't act on it. And one of the classic signposts of depression is people are very sensitive, and they don't, and they feel when they're not accessing their true self, their true nature, and they long for that. And that not having access because we protected ourselves so incredibly well is depressing because we don't have access to our true love, our true nature, our ability to be joyful. We don't have access to that. So the nature of us is to be loving and joyful and kind. Depression is the lack of that experience, the lack of having access, not knowing where to go to get that. I have rarely seen in relationship that people have and created over the many years of their life a relationship that they can trust, or that they might not even know is there. I love my husband, but I don't act on it. I do yoga, I have a spiritual teacher, he watches the game. We're on different paths. Yes, I love him, but I can't act on it until he does it what I think he should do, which is be a yoga person and you know, go to yoga class, and then we'll be on the same path. That's not true at all. The reality is that you love him. And the reality is you're acting on what you think he should do, which is do yoga, versus on versus the fact that you love him. The fact is you love him. Why not act on it? What would you lose to sit next to him and watch the game? He'd be like in pig heaven if you he ever did that. Like, oh my God. He don't like tell you all about like what's going on. Not that you probably even care, but it's an expression of love for you to lay down pavement in your brain that allows you to feel more willing to love that man. And that man who watches the game, who is a platform of love and safety for you, may be the best guru, teacher you could ever ask for. But we run off to the yoga mat, or we run off to the guru, or the teacher, and we get our teaching there. And not to say you can't have it all, but I'm saying we oftentimes miss the, the most important teacher in our lives, which is right next to us, the platform of security and safety that might be 20, 30, 40 years in the making, but you don't act on it. So what I would say to answer this question is, act on the truth. Do you love him? Yes. Make a love letter. I would ask you all to write a love letter before Valentine's Day to your Valentine. And write a letter of all the things you love about that person. And as you write that letter, ask yourself how it makes you feel. How do you feel writing that letter? And if it makes you feel good and warm and fuzzy and loved and cared for and appreciated, then you must use that letter as a template of the truth of the relationship, and then you must put it into action. To the extent that it affects you is to the extent that it is your opportunity to take a transformational action step, and you must free yourself with that action step. That's the goal. So, so when you write that letter, you realize and you tap into the truth, and now we, we take random, acts of kindness based on that letter. So all you have to do is start sending little messages based on that truth. And that is the way to begin to dig out of a long-term you know, relationship that has left me sort of depressed. I'm longing to express my love. That's what we lack. We lack for the expression of the truth. The sun is not shining out. You're waiting for all the sun to shine in from somebody else. And the only way you're ever going to get filled up is by being the sun. Now, I'm not saying that you can't love yourself, care for yourself, nurture yourself. You know, take, you know, I think it's fine to do that. You might say, well, it's selfish to pamper myself. If that pampering provides a platform for you to feel healthier and more energized, to start letting some of the delicate petals of your flower open so you can give love and be loved, then that is well spent. But make no mistake, it isn't the pampering yourself or being loved by another that will ever fill you up. It's the ability to be loved that will fill you up. That's what will fill us up on this in this life. So we need to begin to look for the opportunities to love and, and look for where on your radar screen have you created reasons why I can't love this person because they're not safe? I can't love this person because they're throwing darts at me. I can't love this person because they've got thorns. <clears throat> so I have all these reasons why I can't be loving. But that's just based behavior based on them. Why don't you just say, I have compassion for that person. They're hurting. Let me be nice to them. I have compassion for this person who's throwing darts at me or has thorns. 
and I have such gratitude for being able to see that this person's hurting and then be able to act on my truth, which is love and joy and compassion, and give that. And that's the truth. And I tell you what, when you do that, the sun doesn't care if the flower blossoms. I, we get that. But I don't think the sun can help notice that the earth is a pretty cool place. So when you are the sun, you can't expect them to do anything with that love. But you can absolutely um, notice that the petals of their flower are blossoming. And you're being willing to be the truth of you. And that is a relationship I call true love, an eternal expression of love experiencing self. A couple other questions here. Um, are there herbs that help manage negative or uh, uh, unfriendly thoughts? Well, yeah, absolutely there are herbs for that. Um, we have a whole host of them on our website that you can go to and you can read. Um, there's an herb called the copa, which has been shown to match the effectiveness of the Prozac in one study, which is a phenomenal herb for mood stability. Uh, it's a, one, of the, one of the herbs we know is called the brain-derived neurotropic factor, which means it makes your brain bigger. Uh, our B12 boost it actually makes your brain bigger, supports brain function. Ashwagandha, good for energy and also brain control, it actually rejuvenates brain function. An herb called Brahmi, Brahmi brain is a great herb for mental clarity and focus and, and happiness and joy and more of mental awareness so you become more aware of, of the opportunities that exist in your day and your life. You know, those are, those are powerful, powerful places. If anybody has questions too, you can also press star two and I'll answer some questions here um, along the way as well. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things that <clears throat> I think is important, another thing that's important to realize is that in Ayurveda, I wrote an article called Your Emotional Body Type. And your emotional body type is that ability to um, be aware of your impact on the world, your sort of emotional footprint. Actually, there are two articles, one called the Emotional Body Type, one called the Emotional Footprint. And the Emotional uh, Footprint article is like, I think of this analogy if you're walking in a Disney movie and uh, you're walking through a garden and are the flowers sort of, uh, you know, running away from you or are they reaching out to experience you? And when you begin to act on your truth, your love, and you're giving yourself fully like the sun, the flowers, the people are going to feel safe because they feel you, they know you. If you walk into a room contracted and withdrawn, they don't know that you're the sun, the moon, the light, and they don't know what's up. So they don't feel safe around you. So when people don't feel safe, they go into their protective pattern. They build up their wall, they throw their thorns, and when you feel that, you feel like they don't love you. You feel like they don't like you. So, so your emotional footprint is an impact that you make on someone else's feelings. And you may walk into a room like a bull in a china shop and hurt somebody's feelings without even knowing it. And then three days later, you walk and you see that person and they're being sort of mean to you. And you have no idea that they're still reacting to what you created three days ago. So before you quickly go to blame and judge another person, you might want to realize that what you may have put out three days ago might be finally coming back to you as a dart thrown in your direction. And you might realize that that you, with more awareness, you just accept the fact that if a dart's coming your way, that person is hurt, and I may have been the one to hurt them. I may have been responsible for that. So instead of, you know, judging them and, you know, pushing them out of my life, I'm going to open my heart and act on my truth, my nature, to be loving and joyful and kind. This is a, it's a, a, an emotional body type we call sattva or sattva. Sattva is the ability to be loving and joyful and kind for no reason. And in Ayurveda, is how we're born. But quickly we realize that it's not safe, you have to create all these personality traits. And as a result of that, we create a rajasic, stimulated mindset. The mind goes, I can get happy from dark chocolate. I can get happy from ice cream. I can get happy from new clothes and going shopping, going to the movies, 
And so I create a world of stimuli. And that's a rajasic world. We live in an extremely rajasic world, a world that, uh, a world that is um, um, unable for us to uh, ever be satisfied by that stimuli. And when we become overstimulated, we become unable, we become unable to uh, be satisfied. So we move into a tamasic experience. And when we go into a tamasic experience, we wall off, we check out. And that's where many of us live our life. We live ourselves too old to change. We don't have emotional experiences. We don't have emotional feelings. And we check out. So the goal of the understanding your Ayurvedic body type or your emotional body type, and you can take a questionnaire on my website and find out how much tamas, tamasic behavior you have, how much rajasic behavior you have, and how much sattvic behavior you have. And it's really interesting because if you have an experience where you are... Um, overly tamasic, and you then look and you see on the questionnaire, it can give you some insights as to where we need to scrub some old protective emotional behavior. So it's a great tool for us to kind of get on track and realize, wow, I really have this behavioral pattern in this particular area. So I've got a question here um, from uh, Philadelphia. The name on the phone is Beck. Are you there? Are you there? Namaste. Uh, Namaste. That's it. Hi. Hi. So, in understanding this process that we, you know, are just gone and we are just feeling of love and joy and you know, that's all great. That's the goal and that's the yes, we are. So, I'm wondering if you could speak about when people have certain emotions that come up and so they, be, you know, to some degree, I guess, validated and, you know, there's so many different techniques out there that you can see emotions, visualize the emotions, and you know, then you end up at that end goal, which you know, you end up in a transform. And I'm wondering if you have any to add to that as far as like the person's feeling sad, sad, sadness. It's not enough to say, well, I'm sure you're feeling at the end goal, you feel low, and you are, and you're asking, sure. I mean, that sounds all good, and you know, on a deeper level, it's true, but there's sort of like that bridge that has to be crossed. That, you know, the emotions somehow have to be written out, minus the story, because what we tend to do in Western psychology is write on the, you know, what is me, my life, my story, 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 you know, and I rather than know story is not as important as it's being with the emotions. So can you talk about what you do with the emotions, bring it to that level of joy and bliss and true love and contentment with the other? Well, I think that, you know, the, the key, you know, I guess there's an old Ayurvedic saying, never entertain negativity. And it's not, and, and that can be misunderstood as sort of being um, in a situation where I don't, I don't uh, acknowledge my emotions or I suppress my emotions. And that's not, I don't think, what was meant by that. The idea is that if you're feeling sad, then um, it's fine to experience sadness. But you want to realize that if you experience sadness and you become a sad person, that's not truth. That's not the truth of you. You're a, you're a very joyful, happy, delighting, giving, kind person experiencing some sadness. There's nothing wrong with that. When you become happy when good things happen and unhappy when bad things happen and your world depends on what's, your happiness depends on what's happening around you, then you've created an experience where, the, where your, your happiness is dependent on outside influences on other people. So the way out of that is to begin to take action. And this is the missing piece. You know, people, I wrote an article called The Psychophysiology of Stress, uh, and it's on my website. You can get a, look, get a look at it. And it really introduced the, this whole concept to the Ayurveda community that the whole point of, of Ayurveda was to get to a place of self-awareness where we can then take action steps to free ourselves from old patterns of behavior that aren't serving us. And that starts with simple steps like random acts of kindness. We all have a relationship that we feel safe in. Find that relationship and start acting on it. And the more you act on it, you lay down roads and pavement that can open you up and free yourself to taking you know, other fruit on the tree and picking the fruits that maybe are less right and challenging yourself to love when it's a little bit more challenging. But it doesn't mean to to suppress the emotion of being sad. If you're sad, you're sad. I get that. But that doesn't mean that, you, that, that what we want to then do is begin to look for people that we love and we feel safe and then take random acts of kindness to facilitate that. And when you do it, 
you taste the truth of you, and then that truth of you begins to over, over, overflow. Now, there are situations where you're sad about another person, and you wish that they would love you, and you wish they would, they would care for you more, and then you realize that maybe they are not loving you back the way that you want. And I always say that sometimes you have to realize that you're in a relationship with a rock or a flower. Uh, when you love a rock or the sun gives its light to a rock, the rock just sits there and sucks up the sun and takes on all the warmth. And when you love a flower, the flower blossoms and follows you around the sky and does all kinds of things. But so when the sun continually loves the rock and the rock does absolutely nothing with that love, when you love someone, they never respond and you continue to love the rock you might realize that it's a beautiful rock, the sun never stops shining light on the rock, but it has a relationship with the flower. So sometimes in relationship, you might have to move on beyond the rock and find yourself, you know, interacting, communing with a flower, which is blossoming and interacting with you. But the sun never stopped shining on the rock. It didn't say, okay, screw the rock, that person's no good, they're a loser, I'm never going to like them or talk to them again. It just continues to have compassion and gratitude and understanding for the rock, but it never actually stopped loving the rock. So in some situations, you do have to move on, but you can never really know for sure if you were if it was right to move on unless you gave yourself fully to that rock. Because sometimes the reason why that's a rock in the first place is because they never felt loved enough, secure enough to feel safe to open the petals of their flower because you never gave yourself fully that relationship in the first place, and they never felt loved by you. So they retreated into the cocoon. We call that a tamasic cocoon, and they never felt safe. So that's where they stay. And it appears to be a rock. But when you begin to give yourself fully, the petals of their flower begin to open, and you realize that they were never a rock. Sometimes they're rocks, and sometimes they're flowers. Does that make any sense? Yes. Good. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. I've got one more question here from Providence, Rhode Island. Um, are you there? Yes, yeah, I'd like to be here. Hi. Um, I was wondering how uh, one uh, finds that self-fulfillment um, uh, in themselves, and if uh, transcendental meditation or another type of meditation um, are tools to do that. You know, one of one of the most powerful tools to get out of the crazy illusion of your mind and drop into the truth of you is meditation. There is no doubt about that. And there are many, many different types of meditation. We actually have a meditation course that we're launching here very soon, which I think is really amazing because it's very, very beautiful and easy for people to learn. I found over the years a lot of people have trouble meditating and having success with meditation will become very frustrated with it. Um, but meditation, which means transcending thoughts and thinking and dropping into that true experience of who you are, is a beautiful way of sort of dipping the dye in the cloth of your true self and then bringing that out into the world is an absolutely, uh, you know, uh, extremely important technique. I think with so many tools, Yoga will do the same thing. Meditation will do the same thing. Breathing will do the same thing. An Ayurvedic lifestyle, getting your body back into balance, all those things are required. But meditation, you know, from the simple point of self-awareness, is critical. However, I should say that if you meditate, and you can meditate for 20, 30 years, and if you don't take action based on the awareness that you gain with meditation, it's a, it's a waste of time because you won't make transformational change. You keep thinking down the same neural pathways. You must engage in transformational action with the awareness. And that action it has to be based on your truth, your, your nature, which is to be loving and joyful and kind for no reason. So, you know, if you're meditating and you go lie, cheat, and steal every day, and I've watched this happen over the years, for 30 years, i watched this happen, you must help hold their hand so they can get back into acting on that love. Because it's scary to act on the love. And you could have the awareness that I'm loving, but not act on it, and make no new neural pathways in your brain, and not ever free yourself. And that's the goal of Ayurveda. And that's that article that I wrote, The Psychophysiology of Stress. It quotes the Vedic textbooks throughout the entire article. 
documenting that this is what exactly Ayurveda was about. It wasn't about just you know getting healthy or having no back pain or heart no heartburn. It wasn't just about meditation. It was about using those as tools to free yourself and transform old emotion and 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 allow yourself to you know enjoy the nature of us and enjoy life in a much more content way. And that journey, by the way, doesn't end. Like you don't just get there someday. I'm all now. I'm all done. It's a never-ending journey. So stop looking down the road 5, 10, 15, 20 years when I get enlightened. Start enjoying the moment every single day. Take action to love the people that you're next to every single day. Pick those, those ripe fruit on your tree and take action to love people that you do care about as opposed to taking it for granted. And this Valentine's Day, I encourage you all to, you know, to, to identify the real love that you have for this person. And then in some way, act on it big. Don't hold back. Don't govern it. Don't control it. Don't think that I have to buffer it based on how much they deserve or don't deserve this week or, or because of whatever. Just go for it and go big. And watch how it fills you up to think about how you can give yourself fully to this person this whole week and definitely on Friday on Valentine's Day. All right, guys. Thanks for that call, and thank you all for listening. I appreciate it, and um, have a Valentine's Day.